blooming trees, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Mark. Okay, thank you, it's uh, great to be here. So I'll talk about uh, compression bounded round communication and uh, there is a prequel to this uh, talk that especially if you're watching it, you can look up uh, on the internet by a noob. It was given at the University of Washington. Uh, okay, so just a very quick introduction to two-party communication complexity. So we have two parties, X and Y, with the uh, two inputs, and they want to compute some function f of XY, and they exchange messages. So the first message depends on the input X, the second message depends on the first message and the input Y, and so on, and the goal is in the end for both parties to have the, the output of the f, f of x, y. And it has, uh, so there are several good things about two-party communication complexity. One is that we can actually prove thing, interesting things about it, and it's still uh, unconditionally, and it has a lot of different applications in different areas. So there are several different models of uh, communication. I'll, I'll talk about a couple of them. So the simplest one is deterministic communication. So in, in this case, uh, uh, every message is, uh, is just determined by previous messages and the input uh, of the player. So it's, and it's very convenient to talk about protocols as trees. So here in the, at the top we have a function of the input x and according to the, to the message we, the protocol progresses either right or left and then the next, the next node also belongs to x so, the f so x says something and then the next message belongs to y and so on uh, until we reach a leaf of the protocol tree which contains the output. Uh, and the deterministic communication complexity is just the depth of this protocol tree, which is the same as the length of the longest uh, communication path. Okay, uh, a next model is, so in this talk we'll focus on randomized communication complexity. So this, uh, in the randomized private coin protocols, uh, we have a function, it's still each node belongs to one of the players, but instead of just a value, there is a probability distribution on the messages, and in this case the messages are just zeros and zero ones, so there is a probability of, of uh, saying <coughs> zero and the probability of saying one. And then player x samples from this distribution using private randomness and the protocol uh, continues. So now the leaf that is reached is a, is a random variable and uh, usually we want uh, a, a correct value to the leaf to be a correct leaf with high probability, say two-thirds. And the communication complexity is again uh, the depth of the tree or uh, uh, which is uh, it's not as, as important in this case. One can also talk about the expected communication, uh, which is also interesting in this model. And uh, it's also a, a slightly different model is uh, public coin protocols. Here, uh, the way to think about it is just that there is a shared random tape that both players c have access to. And it's equivalent to, to saying that we use some public randomness to sample a protocol, a deterministic protocol tree, even though it's, uh, and then uh, you use the computation on this tree. And, uh, and it's, this model appears to be stronger than the private coins because you can always simulate a private coin protocol with public coins. So you just partition the cloud of randomness into, all, uh, into X's randomness and Y's randomness and run the private coin protocol, but it turns out that actually it's not much more powerful that you can take a public coin protocol and with uh, very little overhead simulated with private coin protocol. 
So it's th this is actually an interesting model to talk about. And the proof is, very, is uh, it's not computationally efficient, and it's just it's very similar to the proof that the BPP has small uh, has polynomial size circuits. You basically show that it's enough to pick very few good public randomnesses and and use them. Okay, so a variation on, uh, in some sense, on randomized communication complexity is distributional complexity. So here, the inputs from uh, x, y come from some distribution d. And the goal is to compute, uh, the, to evaluate f correctly on most inputs with respect to d, say, two-thirds of the inputs with respect to d. And of course, it's easier than, uh, than doing, uh, it's, it's uh, a weaker model than randomized communication because you can just, uh, if you take your randomized protocol and you fix the randomness random, uh, in a random fashion, you're likely to do well against any distribution. So in particular, there is a fix. There, by a simple probabilistic argument, there is a fixing of the randomness that, uh, that uh, succeeds, say, with respect to two-thirds of D. And it turns out that actually, uh, by a minimax argument, uh, the randomized communication complexity of, of F is exactly, it's, it's a, an exact equality, is exactly the worst case, th uh, is against, the d is exactly the distributional complexity with respect to the worst possible distribution. So one direction, I hope I convinced you it's easy, and the other direction is the hard direction of the minimax theorem that shows that there is a, the hardest distribution against that. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the introduction into, into the communication complexity models. Now I'll talk a little bit about information theory, but uh, it will have a lot of pictures, so don't tune out. Uh, so, fair, so the entropy of a random variable is, is uh, this quantity, which is the expected log of one over the probability. Uh, and the canonical example is if x is a, a uniform point in S, then the entropy is the log size of the set. Uh, okay, next for two uh, random variables a and b, uh, the mutual information is defined as uh, the sum uh, of their entropies minus the joint, the entropy of the joint variables. So the two extreme cases to think about is imagine that A and B are completely independent. Then the entropy of AB is equal to the entropy of A plus the entropy of B because, uh, and uh, so the mutual information will be zero. On the other hand, the, the other extreme is suppose that A and B are the same variable. Then the entropy of H of A, B is, is the same as the entropy of A because there is uh, two copies of A have exactly the same information as one copy of A. So in this case, uh, the mutual information is equal to the entropy of each one. And in general, it measures uh, how much information one cares about the other. And just the technicality, you can condition it on a third variable C, which means that you take expectation over, over C. Okay, so how does it apply to, to protocols? Uh, so we have a public coin, uh, a protocol that uses public randomness uh, and where the inputs come from some, some distribution. And we want to define how much information was conveyed in this protocol. So there are two ways to define it. One is the information learned by the observer. So what is the information learned by the observer? It's the mutual information between the inputs and the transcript and the public randomness. So TR is what's observed, what the observer sees. And X and Y is, are the inputs is what the observer is trying to learn about. And so this, is the, uh, this quantity is the amount of information that an observer that looks at the protocol learns about about x and y. But actually, the more uh, relevant quantity for this talk is information learned by players. 
And uh, so what is that? It's uh, the mutual information between X and the transcript given Y. This is the Y's viewpoint. This is what Y learns about X. So Y, it's given Y. Observing TR, what you learn about X. And similarly, this is what X learns about uh, Y. And which quantity is, is uh, smaller in general? Uh, actually, the second one. The observer learns more because, uh, OK, so why? Imagine, for example, that the distribution on inputs is such that x is always equal to y. Then this is 0 because uh, the players learn nothing. They already, there is nothing more to learn. They already know everything about each other's inputs. But the observer could learn, could learn something. And more generally, this, uh, another interesting fact is that these quantities become equal if the distribution is a product distribution. Because in that case, knowing y doesn't give you any advantage, doesn't put you in any special position with respect to just an observer that doesn't know y. So this becomes the amount learned from the protocol about x plus the amount learned about y period. Uh, so this is smaller. And uh, the main problem that uh, we are trying to solve and uh, have been trying to solve for a while uh, is simulate uh, the protocol in this much communication, in, in the amount of information that's learned by the players. And in some sense, it's the analog of compressing messages. So if you have a stream of messages you want to compress to the entropy, here you have a protocol and you want to co compress it to the information plane. And this is what we will be trying to do in this talk as well. Uh, OK, one more, I think, last uh, information theoretic like quantity. Do you want to relate the previous one to information cost? Which one? Uh, this is the information cost. So it was defined by Yao and the. the so what, when, when they define the information cost, the same notion that's using. Uh, you know, later by uh, Zeran and uh, Barry Stepp and so on, they solved this one. So the, the information cost was this, or it was? I think it was different. Well, maybe it was the first one. It was the first one. No, but but sure this is like more challenging. Yeah, I'm not really sure it was there. It was the, I think that what they called information cost, this quantity was somehow, it was sometimes implicitly de defined. In one, one of the papers, of yes. Disjointness, but explicitly what the people No, no, but they, they uh, the, in the, uh, Original paper that defined information cost, they took the direct sum for information. So that cost. was not for this, that was for the previous cost. For the previous quantity. one. And, and that previous quantity is larger, so simulating I I I is less challenging. So actually, the, the first quantity we know how to simulate. So, yeah, uh, so, 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 yeah, so we have a now simulation that we uh, only a quasi linear simulation for the first quantity. And uh, this this is harder, so this we don't know how to say. And it's not clear that you can do it, actually. But, but somehow intuitively we believe that this is the right notion of information cost. They coincide for product distribution, but yeah. somehow it seems to us that this is the right notion, that when they don't coincide, we should think of this one and not of the other. But yeah, and, uh, and this is kind of the best you can hope for also. We can't, uh, there's no reason to believe that the other one is the best you can hope for. Uh, and this is also what you get from the direct sum as, as your quantity. Okay, so now let's talk about just uh, distribution. So we have two distributions, P and Q. Uh, this is the information divergence between the two distributions. It's, it's an asymmetric quantity, so it's the expectation with respect to P of log P of X over Q of X. So let's see some examples. Uh, if uh, P is a uniform, if Q is a uniform point in this set Q and P is a uniform point in a subset, then the divergence is the log of the ratio between the two, uh, uh, between the two sets. So it's kind of, if I tell you that an element is in Q and then I tell you that this element is actually in P, 
how much more information did you get from, from this fact? And of course, the smaller p is the more information, added information you learn from this fact. Uh, and note that if, uh, if p didn't come, if, if there was a point in p that's not in q, then this quantity would be infinite because somehow uh, you'd get, uh, you get an, a, an infinite quantity here. Okay, so here is a, an important identity that we'll use. Uh, a mutual, the mutual information between x and y is the expectation, with res well, this is a symmetric quantity, but one way to break it down is the expectation with respect to y of the divergence between x conditioned on y and just x. So you take a typical element of y and you ask how much more information x added information x conditioned on this y does it, uh, contains. So again, let's look at two extremes. If, if x and y are independent, then the divergence is zero because it's just x here and x here. So the divergence is zero, which is, and the mutual information is also zero. And on the other extreme, if x is equal to y, then you get expectation with respect to x of just a singleton with respect to x, and this is just the entropy. This is just, if you, if you open it up, you'll see that it's just a fancy way to rewrite the entropy. So, so this is, a, and it also makes sense uh, because it's, for a typical y, how much more information condition on y add to x. Uh, okay, so uh, let's now, I, now I want to show it to you how to simulate one round, a one round protocol. So it's the same problem, but instead of having multiple rounds, uh, you have only one round and say X speaks. So first of all, because X speaks, X doesn't learn anything from this communication because you don't just learn by, by saying something, you have to listen. So this is zero, uh, and this is the amount of information that Y learns from this communication. And our goal, but the message that X, uh, that X sends could be much, much longer than this quantity because uh, there could be redundancy, there could be prior knowledge, and, uh, and so on. So let's, uh, let's break it down. So, the, the, the amount of information learned by y is the expect, uh, you take expectation over excess. So this is the, the actual distribution of the, on the, of the protocol because this is the protocol conditioned on x, the person who speaks. It's the message that you would send. Yes, which is in this case just the message. So this is the actual distribution of the message to be sent px, and only x knows px, uh, because only x knows the input x. Uh, and this is the prior on, on the protocol according to y. This is what y's prior belief about, uh, about the mess, what x is going to say. So, uh, so this is py. And and for each specific x, the amount of information is the divergence between these two quantities. It's the divergence between what x will say and what y thinks that x will say. And, if, and in a sense, if the divergence is high, it means that uh, a lot of information is, conver is conveyed. And if the divergence is low, then little information is conveyed. Uh, yes, and then it would be uh, just the entropy just of the entropy TR, of TR yeah. which is, uh, you, you get back, uh, uh, yeah, so in this case. And the goal is to simulate the entropy of X or the entropy of X given Y? The entropy of X TR. of TR given Y. Of TR given Y, yeah. Yes. So so which is the, what Y learns, yes. It's, uh, uh, and the goal is to simulate the protocol using this many bits of communication, O tilde, or, or just O of I, or, or some, something close to this. Okay, so now it becomes a sampling problem. 
so the so x has a, a distribution p x, y has a distribution p y, and they want to sample from p x together. Uh, okay, so let's uh, have uh, some simple warm-up exam uh, examples first. It's not clear that the problem is for them to sample uh, together from px. It's just for x to send a message which is that long. For I yeah, but one way to solve it is to sample together with from px. That would... That your system is trying to simulate it by, uh, by uh, one message protocol where x sends a message. No, actually. You are trying to simulate... We are trying to simulate it with with uh, an interactive protocol. So, but the goal is for, for y yeah, to be able to compute. Not yeah. Not necessarily one round. No. But, but the, the goal is to, to, learn the to learn that message. So the, the goal is that uh, you, you, you... Yeah, you is to sample it and learn it. So sampling it and then sending it is not an efficient way of dealing with it because it's, uh, you, you somehow lose, uh, your information blows up if you do the that. The message could have been long. Uh, the message could have been long and you want to leverage the fact that you have this shared randomness. So let's see a very simple example. Suppose that px and py are the same thing, just a uniform distribution on some set q, which means that px is independent of x because for any x, you, you have the same distribution, and the divergence is 0. So in this case, for example, you want to simulate it with a 0 uh, communication protocol. So how do you do it? Well, you look at the random tape, and you interpret it as random elements from the set q and you just output q1. Okay, so it's not, it's not sophisticated. Uh, you just, uh, you both know the same distribution. You, you can just sample together. You don't need any communication. Okay, so this shows that uh, shared, shared randomness is useful in this setting, if nothing else. Okay, so an interesting special case that actually has been so, uh, previously solved is when the distribution is the product distribution so that the, tr uh, the transcript is independent of y. Because now, if, uh, if the distribution is a product distribution, the expected, the, the distribution of the transcript given y is the same as just the distribution of the transcript given nothing. Because y doesn't add any information to what x is going to say. Which may, and the consequence of this is that the distribution py is known to both players, to both x and y. Uh, okay, so and the goal is still the same. So x, ha, uh, x knows the distribution px and also the distribution py. y only knows the distribution py. And the goal is to jointly sample from px. So let's look at the following example. Uh, px is a uniform point in p, py is a uniform point in q, and uh, the ratio is, say, 2, so we want to sample with an expected one or constant number uh, of bits of communication. Uh, okay, so the important fact here is that uh, player x knows the distribution q. Okay, so how should we do it? Well, we can again interpret the joint randomness as uh, random elements from Q. But now we can't just take Q1 because Q1 might not belong to P. So uh, the X player looks up the first element on the tape that belongs to P and, uh, and sends its index. And because in this case the ratio was 2, the expected length of this index is constant. And actually, and if the ratio was 2 to the K, then the expected length of the index would be K or some constant, small constant time scale. Okay, so the protocol is just look, interpret the random tape as elements from Q, uh, uh, sampled according to Q, and pick the first element that uh, happens to belong to P. And just send the index, and, and that's it. You, you've done sampling. And this actually... The general problem is slightly more involved, but uh, it's similar ideas. It's, uh, it was uh, in this paper by Harsha et al. from 2007. Uh, so what they do, they sample with no error, and in communication complexity, that is uh, the divergence plus, plus a constant. 
And actually, in this case, in their case, uh, it's a one round protocol. So it, in that case, it's in their case, it's possible to do it in one round. In our case, I don't believe. In, in the general case, I actually don't believe you can do it in one round. But it's uh, of course we can. The protocol you described is, is one round right now. Yeah, this protocol, the protocol I described is one round, and the generalization is also one round. Or actually, the original protocol. Yeah. Would be also yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, okay, but the, unfortunately, in the general case, it's not true that the, that X knows PY. So actually, X doesn't know PY, which in the in that picture means that player X doesn't know the set Q. So uh, let's look at the same example again. Uh, again, the divergence is one. P is a subset of Q of size. Uh, Half, um, half Q, and they want to sample uh, jointly from P, but now Q is not known to player X. So this is uh, fairly unfortunate because there isn't even a common ground to start. So before, the common ground for starting the protocol was uh, look at the set Q and interpret, it as, uh, interpret the tape as elements from Q. Now there isn't a common a common ground to start the protocol from. So something, some other idea is necessary. Uh, and our main result is that we can sample with error epsilon using the divergence plus uh, lower order terms of communication. Uh, pl plus log one over epsilon uh, of communications. So here is the... But it is an interactive protocol. And part of the reason why it's interactive is because we don't assume ahead of time that we know how long it will take. So if it wasn't, know that here, uh, if you want, so, OK, a non-interactive protocol would be a protocol where the X player says something, and then that's it. But one immediate problem, so before, the player X knew the divergence. At least he knew this number. Right, so you, you knew, okay, the divergence is 70, I should expect to send 100 bits of communication. Now, the divergence is not, it depends on Q, and X has no idea what Q is. So the protocol should be such that the communication is, is uh, depends on the divergence that has to be discovered during the protocol. So you shouldn't expect uh, an in, a non-interactive protocol because No, but you have no idea what the divergence is. So you know what we expected. You, you know it's for typical y what the divergence is. Uh, is it obvious that you, you can't do it with L? You can, uh, OK, so for you have to adjust the case. He's talking about the case where you don't know because he's you know, forgot about the communication yeah, complexity. If, if, yeah, for maybe you can, uh, for the communication complexity application, maybe you can do something. Well, in general. Have, like, in the general case, that you, you're given also a promise on the bound. Yeah, if you have a promise on the bound, you can uh, probably it's possible, but in, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's possible actually. And maybe in the communication application, you can assume that you have yes. a promise on the bound because the expected bound. Is but in general, uh, you can't. Of course, if you want, if this is your problem, you're just given P and Q, and you want to do this, you can't hope to be independent. Because well, you can't expect to work for all possible spectra of the divergences and still uh, not be interactive. Uh, okay, so here is uh, the protocol in this case. We interpret the random tape as elements, as random elements from the entire universe, not just from the set Q, because we don't know the set Q. And now Alice, uh, the player X looks at, uh, at the tape and finds the elements uh, that belong to P. And the output will be the first element that belongs to P, which is uh, U6 in this case. Okay. No, well, that will be the output. You can't send it. Ah, because to send it, uh, you need to specify an element. Okay. So it will not be the output. Six is huge here. Six is log the size of the universe. 
So this is what they are supposed to agree on. But they, they have to agree on 6, but you can't afford to send 6 because 6 is huge. 6 is the divergence between P and the entire universe. Uh, OK, but luckily, Bob, uh, the Q player, also has a slightly bigger set, which means that he can single out a few more elements on the tape. So say his candidates are U2, U6, and U7. And he doesn't know which ones of those belong to uh, P. But with a little bit of communication, uh, with some hashes, uh, by sending a few hash functions, it's possible to eliminate 2 and 7 and agree on U6. And this is basically the idea. Uh, but you can see that, uh, that somehow the inherent, uh, the error, for example, is inherent in here because if you're unlucky with the hashes, you're talking about things that are way too long for you to actually talk about explicitly. So uh, you, you have to rely on, on uh, something like hash functions. But of course. Uh, and there's also some uh, exponential, uh, you know, like you try hashes of length 2, 4, 8, and so on. So let me show you the general protocol because it's, I think it's also interesting. So let's re remember the goal is uh, to sample using order of log 1 over epsilon plus the divergence number of bits. Actually, now that we've written it down carefully, we can sample with the divergence plus lit plus O of square root of the divergence plus log 1 over epsilon, but that's not important. It's just a constant. It's important for some of the applications. So we have public randomness. So our universe, let we take the universe U and uh, the interval 0, 1. So, uh, uh, and this is the histogram of Px, and this is the histogram of Py. So, so again, this graph is, uh, the x-axis is the universe, the y-axis is the 0, 1 interval. So the area here is u, and here at the bottom we have the histogram of, of the distribution Px with area 1. And it's just a coincidence that Px and Py are mirror images of each other. And that's because uh, it's hard to draw two sets of the same area using a, a, a different. Could do it even if it was flat? Uh, yeah, but uh, not in PowerPoint. Uh, OK, so what's the protocol? So the, uh, the protocol is to sample, uh, to throw darts at this board. You use shared randomness to throw darts at this board, which you can do jointly because uh, there is no communication here. You just throw roughly u dart, u is the size of the universe, you throw u darts on the board. So in expectation, one of the darts will fall under p, under the histogram of p, and actually the output will be the first dart to fall under the histogram. And if, you, if u is not enough, you take 2u and so on. It's not, it's not a big deal. Okay, so now the problem is communicating this U4 to the Y player. So how does the protocol proceed? Well, the Y player also looks under his histogram and sees which element fall under, under the PY histogram. So in this case, he thinks the output is U2. Okay, so let's see. This, the, the X player sends a hash of U4. And then the, the Y player sees if the hash passes the test or not. So we were unlucky and the first hash passed. So he's now more certain that U2 should be the output. But then he sends a second hash. It doesn't match, which means that U2 cannot be the hash, is a bit. hash is just one bit. You need to, OK, so this is the, the nice feature is that you don't care about the divergence. Uh, you need to try something like one over, uh, log 1 over epsilon hashes so that because we allow ourselves an epsilon error. So you can think of it as just a hash of one hash of length log 1 over epsilon. And then yeah. Uh, OK, so it failed. What, so what do we do now? OK, we know so the Y player is out of option. So he sends failure, and now he doubles his histogram. So he looks at the 2PY histogram. And now know that U4 is, fell under, under the double. It wasn't under the histogram, but it's under the double histogram. And uh, 
it, he already has some hashes to work with, so he matches these hashes, sees that it matches, and now he gets more hashes uh, and eventually he is pretty sure comfortable with that u4 is the answer, in which ca at, at which point the output uh, success. And know that uh, the protocol either samples u4 or nothing at all, so the distribution is correct because the distribution of the x, x coordinate of the first element under the histogram is exactly px, and with very high probability, uh, unless, unless there is a false positive, it's very high probability they will succeed at output in the correct element. What, what's 2PY? So 2PY is double the histogram of PY, which is just you take uh, every column you, you, you double. Oh, oh, so that's so actually easy to do in PowerPoint. That's easy to do in PowerPoint because uh, you can just stretch. And, and if it failed, then you would go to 4PY. Uh, actually, the the way you do it in the paper, you go to 2 to the 1, 2 to the 4, 2 to the 9, but think about it, you just go to 4 py, 8 py, and so on, until you manage to cover uh, u4, or until you are unlucky and you return a false positive, which, have, which we can manage to do with very small probability. Okay, so uh, let's analyze it. Suppose that... Uh, px is 2 to the minus k of py of u4. Then the protocol will, k, will take k rounds of, uh, of doubling the histogram. And there will be roughly, two to, uh, when you um, take PY, uh, the histogram of py and multiply it by 2 to the k, you'll have roughly 2 to the k candidates and falling under this uh, stretched histogram. And so you'll need roughly k plus log 1 or epsilon hashes to narrow it down to 1 or to be comfortable that if something, if, uh, if you did get an element that passes all the tests, then it's the correct element. So the contribution of u4 to the cost is the probability px of u4 that you selected this element under the distribution of the x player times k, which is log px of u4 over py of u4 plus this log 1 or epsilon term. And uh, so this is exactly the divergence between px and py. The first term is exactly the divergence between px and py. And uh, the second term just add, you just, this adds up to one, so you get. This work? Uh, you get uh, uh, this log, uh, the divergence plus log one over epsilon. Okay, so from here we can go to compression protocols. So just a second, the, you know that the divergence on both rounds is a low bound also. If you are simulating a one round protocol, the number of rounds you use is about the divergence. Do you know that it's a low bound on the number of rounds to do what you want? No, it's not. There is a trade-off between... Uh, no, in this communication, if you want communication... No, I can, I actually, we, we, we probably won't write, write it up, but I can do log of the divergence with pain a constant factor in the communication, I think. So instead of doubling, every time uh, square the histogram. So instead of so instead of going two, four, eight, go two to the two, two to the four, two to the eight. It's you overshoot by a factor of two. So here instead of k, you risk to get two k at most. So you overshoot by a constant. Yeah but you reduce the number of rounds expansion. For our main application, we actually wanted to get rid of the constant in front of the divergence. So what we get in the end is d plus square root of d plus log 1 over epsilon plus o square root of d. Okay, so do you know that log the divergence is the log I think so, but uh, I'd have to 
check it more carefully, but I think, oh, that it's a lower bound. Yeah, it's a lower well, bound it, it's, bound. it's a trade-off again. If you're willing to tolerate a sub, a super constant blow-up no, in the no, communication, no, I can... No, you are not. Is then. So maybe, so maybe just by some kind of uh, just the fact that you have to guess. It doesn't matter. I what don't is know. I'm just asking if they know. Mm, we don't know, but it's I. It's probably true. But uh, there is a more fundamental. If you want to think about uh, this uh, simulation, there is a more fundamental problem of whether you can get get of the uh, get rid of the error altogether. So it seems obvious somehow that. Without any prior knowledge, you can't hope to have an error-free protocol. But actually, we can't prove it. So uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting possibility. OK, so now I want to, in the about five, 10 minutes, I want to go through some of the corollaries. So what we did, uh, so we go back to the protocol. So we have a protocol uh, with information ID. and what we, what we proved, uh, or what follows from the discussion, is that a protocol with information IK and K rounds of communication can be compressed into a protocol with, with communication IK plus O tilde of IK plus K. So you pay the information cost plus uh, a constant or something polylogarithmic per round uh, to, to cover for the error and so on. Actually, it's... It's it's a it's just log epsilon, but well, it's actually logarithm. It's log one over epsilon, and uh, uh, the the actual thing that you pay here is is just one over epsilon. So uh, is log one over epsilon plus a constant. Uh, okay, so let's. Uh, I want to introduce some quantities, uh, so I can state the results. So. Uh, C is the uh, distributional, or I, I'm, I'll talk about distributional communication complexity. So C is the communication complexity, I is the information complex, the information complexity. What's the information complexity is you say, okay, I don't care how long the protocol will be, I want to convey as little information, as, reveal as little information as possible to the players. So I is, uh, is uh, this quantity generally smaller than C, and CK and IK will be the same where you limit yourself to at most K rounds of communication. So trivially, the information complexity is less than communication complexity because a communication protocol with C communication cannot reveal more than C bits of information. And uh, I is equal to limit, so, so I, doesn't have to be realized by any finite protocol. It's logically, at least, it's possible that you have a, a sequence of ever-growing protocols that reveal less and less information, and that converts to some quantity i in the limit. So i is uh, equal to the limit of uh, i k as k goes to infinity. Well, for c, it doesn't happen. So c is obviously less than if you bound yourself to just k interaction. So a pointer ch chasing is an example where actually there is a gap here, but if you, but c is equal to cc because you can never use more than c rounds of interaction. And what we proved is that c is less than uh, ik plus k. And I want to point out the previous uh, in our previous paper, we showed that if you have a protocol with information content ic prime, and communication C prime, you can compress it to square root of I C prime times C prime. But this is incomparable because, because here it's, we are talking about communication. Here we talk about the number of interactions. And communication could be much bigger. So even though uh, here we have a geometric mean and here it's arithmetic mean, uh, it's, uh, those are incompa incomparable results. And uh, an important open problem that I'll come back to is whether you can actually compress all the way to the information content. Uh, okay, so direct sum, th uh, now I'll talk about direct sum theorem. So direct sum theorem 
says something about the, the hardness of n copies of n in terms of uh, the hardness of uh, uh, the, the hardness of computing n copies of f in terms of the hardness of computing one copy. And uh, in communication complexity, the, the main open problem is whether computing n copies is n times as hard as one copy or whether you can save something from having multiple copies. And in our previous paper, we showed that it's at least square root 10 as hard as one copy. And the way it follows from the fact that the information cost of one copy is less than the communication cost of n copies over n. So even though we don't have a direct sum for co communication cost, we have direct sum for this notion of information. So this was also the, the same inequality was used in the original yes. with the other information. Yes, because yes. Uh, they got uh, an exact direct sum for that notion. Yes. For their notion, they had a but it's theory. not enough for for general non non product distributions, which is uh, what you need to to use Yao's lemma. So the problem is that if you want to a, a theorem about randomized as opposed to distributional complexity, it's minimax over all distributions, including non product ones. So you you should be able to handle any distribution. It works for uh, for any distributional and by as a consequence for randomized, because f the way you go from distributional to randomized is through minimax, which has to work for any distribution. So when, when you say this follows from the following fact, what follows from what? So well, this follows from the compression and this fact. The compression, like the result in the previous. Uh, yes. So now we prove the uh, this bound. Uh, on uh, uh, on the communication complexity, and it implies that if you limit yourself to k rounds, for at least for a bounded round, if you if you want a bounded round protocol for f n, you can do better than n times the protocol for f. So if you if you are going, if you hope to save on n copies, it has to be a highly interactive protocol. Otherwise, uh, otherwise there is a direct sum result. Of course, it doesn't rule out a highly interactive. Uh, Couldn't you just what you use what you said to also show like a even a, a something stronger? That yeah, you could have some bound here on the right. number of interactions. If that was the O1, then the other one will be O1 as well, or something. Or right? something like that, but you have to be careful. But and so this is one application. But there are more interesting applications that I want to talk about. One is that what, what follows that information is, equ is exactly equal to amortized communication. So because of this fact, we see that amortized communication is bigger than the information. So if you take communication complexity of fn over n, it's bigger than i of f. What we get from this work is that the communication, let's start with the communication of fn. It's bounded if you take a k round, uh, a k interaction protocol for fn plus k. Uh, so now let's pull n out of this. So we get, uh, so information unlike communication passes through direct sum. So we have the ik of one copy plus k over n. <laughs> now let's take, uh, think about k is large and a n is even larger. So k over n tends to 0, and i k of f tends to i, I of f. Because uh, eventually, if I allow more and more uh, interaction, uh, i of k of f tends to i of f. And we get this equality in the end, that uh, as n goes to infinity, the inf uh, this one quantity that is information cost actually captures the way things scale to infinity. Uh, okay, uh, and so why does it not give a direct sum result? Uh, why doesn't it give? Because it's conceivable that communication complexity of one copy is much larger. It gives a direct sum result eventually. If you want to see if you can save, f uh, if you can do a billion copy a thousand times more efficient than a million copies, then it gives you something there. 
but it's conceivable that one copy is actually much, much, much more expensive than I of f. And, uh, and then n copies, it would be n times i of f, which is only square root n times the communication complexity of f. So in the limit, you're right. But no, uh, for, yeah, if n goes to infinity, then, then there's, but I it guess that's not a very, very interesting one. Okay. Yeah, if you don't know exactly when this happened, because uh, the, this limit k, uh, you said that i is the limit of i k. Yeah, but you don't know how. Yes. So, but but in the limit, at least uh, we understand how this thing scales. Yeah, scale. it's, it's similar results for XO, then which will somehow be meaningful. With, uh, also, when uh, n, when f is like the yeah, I, I think we we, we can size. prove the same for XO. Right. Yes. So then you, it's interesting, even when f is like a constant size function, and then yes. you show like a, an optimal direct sum in this case. Well, in the limit, at least. Well, it's not, but. But yeah, so actually it's used to show the opposite direction, the upper bound on, on many copies. And finally, something that I, I don't think I have time to go in depth on, but from this discussion, what you get, you get a complete problem for direct sum. So we get a specific problem that, uh, I'm not sure how, what we'll eventually call it, but say the protocol simulation problem, which is basically given to protocol trees that represent a protocol with low information cost simulated. And uh, so this problem has the following properties. The information cost of the problem is, is i. Well, well, what is exactly given to the two players? Uh, you are given two protocol trees. Well, I'm, uh, each player, each player is, give, is given one protocol tree okay. that represent a protocol that has low information cost. And you want to simulate. Uh, it's, it's a promise problem. You want to sample a random leaf. And so, it's, uh, so if you could, uh, if you could uh, so the information cost by definition is i. If you could simulate it, if you could solve this, if the communication complexity of this problem is i, then direct sum holds because then protocol compression holds. And, and you get that uh, the communication complexity of one copy is equal to i, which is what, what we would want. In, uh, he, what we show here is that actually you can do, if you take enough copies, so you have this problem that, is, uh, that seems hard because it, it has a lot of interaction. But if you take many, many, many copies, it will become a flat problem because now if you take enough copies, the, the, f the depth will become negligible compared to the width. So the number of rounds becomes small and the communication complexity of n copies is n times i. And if the communication complexity of this specific problem is much bigger than I, then direct sum fails, at least for distributional complexity, because you get a problem that one copy is hard, but many copies scale like I. So, so we have, in some sense, the hardest problem to argue about for communication complexity. Maybe it's a bit of a tautology, but, but uh, it's a complete problem. And unfortunately, Uh, well, I because it's, it stands or falls on this. Uh, I, I don't think. It's a direct sum question. So right. Yeah, if you compare it like, to our like, result on the, like, the direct parallel repetition for uh, unique games, then like, our result was something similar to this, but there we, you had something to start with uh, because you had uh, an integrality gap. And here you, you don't have a, it tells you if you have like a gap here, then you, you I think it should work for any distribution, I mean, for any distribution. What do you mean? I mean, you should describe, uh, describing a distribution for a distributional problem, you should give a distribution or say that, you, you know, or say. It, it says that if there exists some distribution on which yeah. uh, so I, and yeah, yeah, I and C are far from each other, then uh, there is then direct sum fails. And then with the converse, you want, you want both directions where the... If for every yes. distribution, the yeah. I and C are equal, yes, then, then direct sum holds. Okay. Exactly. And, okay, the main open problem that uh, has m several different angles now is whether information is equal to communication, whether uh, perfect compression is possible. 
and I'm not sure it, it can go either way. The trouble is that if you want to prove lower bounds on this, it has to go through non-information theoretic techniques because uh, by definition. Thank you.